on top of our basement rocks here in the Grand Canyon. Now, I say the carbon dioxide levels were high, they actually didn't stay high. They gradually were drawn back down again. And we can see one of the reasons behind that is we move up the rock layers here in the ground walls of the Grand Canyon, we start finding thick layers of limestone. In fact, just above those beach sands that we were looking at a minute ago, above the Great Unconformity, we find the Muab limestone. A thick layer of limestone representative of limestones that were forming all over the world at that time. Limestones that were made in large part of the uh, partially decomposed shells and skeletons of creatures living on the continental shelves surrounding the continents at that time. Well, now their shells are made up of calcium carbonate. Carbonate contains carbon dioxide. Calcium atom, the carbon dioxide, and one extra oxygen. They lock up carbon dioxide in these layers of limestone. So once again, we're kind of like we were back there in the Precambrian, headed towards a snowball arc. We didn't get there. But we are starting to lock up carbon dioxide in these thick limestone layers about 500 million years ago. And we did manage to lock up, um, or we found a new way, I should say, to lock up carbon dioxide. You know, we've been locking it up in, in shells, in sea creatures on the continental shelves for millions and millions of years. And then when we get up to a rock layer at Grand Canyon that we call the Temple Butte Formation, uh, during the Temple Butte time, land plants invaded the land. Um, I guess that's kind of redundant. I mean, you know, marine plants would stay in the ocean, land plants would stay. But anyway, we get vascular plants growing on the land. It's a whole new world, literally, for these plants. There's, we start to see forests growing for the first time on Earth. The forests grow, they spread further and further inland as plants begin to adapt to getting along without a ready supply of water like they've had in the oceans for millions of years. And in their trunks, in their leaves, they start to lock up carbon. Carbon dioxide that they had drawn from the atmosphere, manufacturing their sugar, or yeah, manufacturing the sugars that then they use to manufacture wood. Some of that carbon got munched on by animals and returned to the atmosphere. Some of that carbon turned into coal and entered the geochemical cycle. And so as land plants diversified across the landscape, we saw our carbon dioxide levels fall even further. Anybody feeling a little chilly? Because they fell far enough that another ice age started, a big ice age. A uh, big ice age down in the southern hemisphere, a uh, land mass that today we call Gondwana, covered with ice sheets. Um, and this was about 340 million years ago. If we look at the rocks of Grand Canyon, we are deceived because what we find are tropical limestones. The environment that we find preserved in the rock layers of the Grand Canyon from this time makes the place look like the Bahamas. And the reason is because we, in what was to become Grand Canyon, northern Arizona, were sitting on the equator. It was like the Bahamas. There was an ice age going on, but we didn't want to have any part of it. We just hung out on the equator and let those guys freeze down there. So in spite of the ice age, uh, plate tectonics and continental drift had come to our rescue and, and spared us some of the, uh, the climatic rigors uh, 340 million years ago during that ice age. We do see the effects of the ice age, though, here in the Grand Canyon. Uh, we look at the red rock layers of the, of the Subai group, and these are the, uh, the same red rock layers that, that you find down in Oak Creek Canyon as well, up in uh, Canyonlands National Park, the Four Corners area. <laughs> Lots of really complicated red rock layers, very, very difficult to tell apart from each other. Um, and one of the reasons that those rock layers are so complicated is because of that ice age. As the glaciers froze up and melted back down again, sea level was rising and falling and sloshing back and forth across the continental shelves and really mixing everything up. And so even though, even though we were in the tropics, a careful look at our rock layers here at the Grand Canyon does reveal some evidence of that ice age in our migrated shorelines. The ice age finally ended right about the time we get to the rim rocks 
of the Grand Canyon. The rocks that we stand on, the rim of the canyon, were deposited in a desert sea, very much like the, uh, the Persian Gulf is today. Uh, Northern Arizona was still in the tropics. It was still nice and warm. We were close to sea level. Sometimes we had uh, desert conditions, big, like, big sand dunes uh, to produce the Coconino sandstone that we can see again in the Grand Canyon and in Oak Creek Canyon. And then the Kaibab limestone that forms the rim of the Grand Canyon, Walnut Canyon, the rim of Oak Creek Canyon, all those areas, all recording that desert environment. So when we get to the rim of the Grand Canyon, we're also standing right on the brink of one of the biggest crises that life has ever faced, uh, probably since oxygen started to accumulate in the Earth's atmosphere. The, the last rock layers of Grand Canyon formed about 270 million years ago, and uh, less than 20 million years after that, the Permian period, a, a subdivision of geologic time, ended. Uh, and there are three events that mark the end of the Permian period. And we'll talk about why that matters. The Siberian traps, which are huge, huge, massive lava flows uh, in oh, no, Siberia, um, were erupted at that time. If we look at uh, the record of carbon dioxide, we find out that there was a huge spike in carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. It had been going down for so long during those ice ages, now it bounced way back up again. And the great dying, the, the greatest extinction that we have a fossil record, record of in the Earth's history. And those things are all related. So we'll start with the Siberian traps. Siberian traps are flood basalts, uh, kind, of like the, kind of like the lava flows that we see here around Flagstaff, multiplied like 50 gazillion times over. They're black, heavy basalt, uh, up, up to, well, I say up to uh, 750,000 cubic miles of basalt. This is actually a conservative estimate. There are some geologists who would take this a lot further. And so to give you kind of a concept of how much that would be, this cube of basalt that I stuck here on this map of Arizona is to scale. So it would be a cube of, of, of basalt that reaches all the way from Flagstaff, past Holbrook, up to Ganado, and goes just as high up into the sky. The, the space shuttle would have to kind of go, mm -hmm, get around it. So that much lava erupted, and it erupted in a very, very short period of time. Uh, we're talking perhaps only hundreds of thousands of years, which geologically is an eye blink. It is almost no time at all to suddenly spew this much, this much lava onto the Earth's surface. Now what happens when volcanoes erupt? Well, we get, we get these volcanic, uh, volcanic gases that boil up out of the volcano, and 73% of the volcanic gases boiling up out of the volcano literally are boiling up out of the volcano because they're water. But 12% of the gas is carbon dioxide. So this is where our carbon dioxide spike probably started from. We also get a mixture of other gases, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, some of which are greenhouse gases in their own right. So the, the eruption of the Siberian traps probably triggered a spike in carbon dioxide levels worldwide. Okay, what happens when the carbon dioxide spiked at the end of the Permian? Well, as temperatures rose, that insulating effect of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere also rose. You may remember back at the beginning of the program, temperatures in Venus are always the same because of its super greenhouse atmosphere. Whether it's day or night, summer or winter, the temperatures are always the same because all that CO2 does such a good job of insulating Venus. Well, the same thing on a much lesser scale was starting to happen on the Earth. That extra carbon dioxide started insulating things. The poles started getting warmer and warmer uh, compared to the tropics. Well now, as the temperature difference between the equator and the poles um, declined, ocean currents started to weaken because ocean, the, the ocean currents flow in response to uh, those climate changes. And so, as the ocean currents weaken, the recharge of the 